Hello, our historians, and welcome to our first part of our lecture where we're in the art of civilizations now. So we've moved on from prehistoric art before writing, and now we're working into the time when there actually is writing, and we kind of know what's going on in history. And at this particular point, we're looking at the development of art that is reflected in the very first civilizations, which makes sense if you think about it after we settle down and start farming and we see things happening like Stonehenge. We start to see, you know, as populations get a little bit bigger, we see these advanced civilizations develop. And as they advance, as we talked about in the context, we're going to see the art and architecture change with it. So that's what we're going to explore is really start diving into those pieces that exemplify those things in this particular lecture. So let's review since we're going to be starting about Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is the land between two rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates, and it's considered the birthplace of civilization or the cradle of civilization because it's really the first place that we start to see the development of cities and states and the complexities that go along with it. Now, Mesopotamia is very, very unprotected. Its borders are very, very bad, um, but it is a very rich area. So it's this area that everybody wants to get their hands on because it is very fertile, as we call it the Fertile Crescent. So these, there's lots of these little states, and a state during this time is an area that is united under a recognized ruler, and that could be just about the size of a city at this time. But as things get more competitive and this area is very rich and people want it, we're going to see this area frequently being fought over. So as it gets taken over, the rulers are going to change. And as a result of that, the art and architecture will change with it. However, some of the things that previous rulers did with their art and architecture are going to continue on because if you take some place over and you can make the transition a little bit easy on people by maybe not changing everything and making it kind of look like it was before, then it's a lot easier to assert your power over that. So we're going to talk about these different groups that are going to rule over Mesopotamia. So we're going to start with the Sumerians. So if you need a way to remember that, it starts with S. Then there's the Akkadians, who we won't really talk about very much because they basically just adapted what the Sumerians did. Then there's the Babylonians, who are actually going to rule over this area twice. And if you um, are familiar with the uh, Bible at all or the Old Testament of the Bible or the Hebrew side of things, you've heard of the Babylonians before because they actually were a really big problem for the Jewish people living in this area because monotheism and Judaism did develop in this area. Abraham was actually from a Mesopotamian city-state. The Hittites are in there but they're not around very long. I call them the hit and run because they, they tried to rule this area from way too far away. So as a result of that, they weren't around very long. The Assyrians are going to be very important in this area and they are really big jerks and nobody really liked them, which was part of their problem. Then the new Babylonians are going to come back, who also really aren't very nice. If you've ever heard of Nebuchadnezzar before, um, who destroyed the Jewish temple, he's actually the Neo-Babylonian ruler at this time. And then we're going to see the Persians, and the Persians are what is modern-day Iran. Okay, so not, they don't consider themselves Arabic, they are Iranian today, but before that they were the Persians, and they are going to expand their empire so far out that they eventually take over Mesopotamia, but are smart enough in their rule to adopt a lot of the things that were already being done there, and when you adopt the culture and you adopt the practices, you typically adopt the art and architecture as well, because it's a visual way to show people the things haven't really changed that much and make the transition to a new ruler easier. So just kind of a map to show you the area that we're going to be talking about right here. So Mesopotamia sitting right in between the Tigris and Euphrates, this wonderful area for establishing farming and irrigation and civilization. And you can see Sumer or Sumeria, this biggest of city states in this area, and some of the other small ones at the time. So one of the things that we see starts in Sumeria, so again, putting the S's together that it kind of starts here, are what's going to be called the ziggurats. And actually some remnants of these do remain in modern day Iraq, um, but they're actually very endangered because ISIS is actively trying to destroy these. And there's a lot of cultural groups in the area trying to protect them because ISIS wants to wipe out any evidence of any other competing heretic religion. And Although this religion of these people is far gone, the artwork definitely represents a history and it's trying to be destroyed. So they're actively trying to protect it. So these ziggurats right here really connect those two R's that we've talked about that are really what this unit is about is religion and rule. And you'll notice that it is made out of local materials because in these areas, you, you don't want, if you're not expanding out yet and the Sumerians weren't, you build with what you have. 
and this area is mud brick. There's not a whole lot of stone available, but the fact that this is still standing says the engineering was pretty impressive. So the ziggurats, okay, which kind of means raised up, were in these Sumerian cities. They were right smack in the middle of them, which is a reminder, a visual reminder that the religion is right at the heart of your civilization or your state, that it rests at the center of everything. And why would rulers want these things built? Well, think about it. If your power as a ruler comes from saying the God said so, then you want as many people believing as much as possible in that religion as you can, all right? So what this would have done, a major massive project like this, like the white ziggurat and its temple, okay, is it would have, A, visually reminded people of the importance of this religion, the religion that the ruler gets his power from, and it also gives people a job to do, which shows their place in society, but also keeps them employed. So if people are employed, they're fed, and half of the problems in history come from hanger, really. So if you can keep your people on a happy note, doing something that visually reinforces the religion and the rule, then that's perfect. So the temple of the white ziggurat and its temple, it was whitewashed because in this area in the desert, the light would reflect off of that light and kind of show like this heavenly glow of how important it is. Obviously, it's going to be waterproof to make sure that of all things, this is the most protected. Now, what's really kind of crazy about the ziggurats is when you walked up them, you think you'd be walking right up the steps and walking right into the temple. So think like the Supreme Court building, like you walk up the steps and you walk right into the door. That's not the case on these. You would walk up the steps and then you would have to walk all the way around this white temple before you could get into the doors as a way of making sure you saw and appreciated all of it. Now, there is a really big belief in early cultures about mountains because mountains were inaccessible to a lot of these people. And they you know, assume that's where the gods resided. Think of Mount Olympus to the Greeks. And we're going to see this in China and India as well. So the whole idea of a ziggurat going upwards. It's kind of like that idea of these mountains where the gods lived at the top, but also this obsession with up and these sky gods and sun gods, because that's where their civilization existence came from, is whether the sun shone and their crops grew. And inside these temples, what we have found are evidence of writing and scrolls and record keeping and which shows that there were things making sure who was offering what, what prayers were being said to the gods. This was a very complex religion and not just animism as we saw before. So this is a reconstruction of what it would have looked like. And if you look at this, it was meant to go up the steps and then you come up here and you need to walk to get to the main entrance. They would want you to walk all the way around. You can see this dude right here coming all the way around because this would have been a pretty significant drop off right here so that you can admire the temple all the way around and admire the gods that it was built for. So these are some of the cylinder scrolls that they have found on the inside as a way to kind of keep the prayers and the messages and the rituals secret. This is what they assume the interior would have looked like based on what they have left behind. And you can see that it's deliberately dark with very, very little light coming in to create that feeling of mysticism that even in this brightness, you're walking into this very, very sacred area. Now, we also have on the 250 these Tel Asmar statues, which are votive statues. And you'll notice that these look like humans, but while they may be realistic, they are not naturalistic because this is not how humans naturally look. Their eyes do not look like that. And so we see deliberate stylization in the eyes of these figures. And there's a reason for that because these ziggurats were actually social status reflectors, and not everybody could go to the top. In fact, only the priest king himself and the priests could go in to the temple, could actually get into that part, because it's a way of reinforcing that the king is more important than everybody else. And this is all about reinforcing that rule. So what people would do is they would ask the rulers to put inside the white ziggurat or ziggurats like this, these statues, these votive figure statues with their eyes constantly wide open and constantly in prayer and in awe of these, these gods as a way to show their devotion. If they couldn't do it in person, they could at least do it this way. Aren't they cute? These are just adorable. So these are called the votive figures and they're actually in the Iraq Museum in Baghdad. 
Um, and it's one of the things that the Sumerians would do is Sumerians were stylizing these little gods as a way to say, okay, we can't go in the temple, but we can put these little statues of ourselves in there so that the gods know that we're always watching and we're always praying and we're always devoted, even though we can't necessarily go there ourselves. Now, we've also found in Sumeria evidence of very, very high social classes. So we know that in this area, there is a major social status to be had by how much of the crops you controlled and how high of status you were. So for example, just like in other cultures, some jobs are more important than others. So we'll see in Egypt, if you could write, that was a very big deal. But of course we know military is a very big deal because these are the soldiers that protect the crops during this time. So in one of the tombs in Sumeria, we've actually found this standard of Ur, all right? And what we know about this is it establishes very early on a very primitive and kind of kindergarten way of telling a story and telling a message. So we're moving up a little bit from the cave paintings. So instead of if Paleolithic times are like kindergarten, we're starting to get into maybe first grade now where okay, if I want to tell that somebody is important, I can put them in the middle, I can make them bigger than everybody else, and I can make them brighter than everybody else. So knowing that, you can probably point out that this person right here is probably the most important person in it. So maybe a god or a ruler. But this standard, kind of like a flag, actually, because it's got stuff on both sides, actually tells a story, but it's made of incredibly rich materials. Like this lapis lazuli blue stone was not really available in this area. So the harder something is to get or make, kind of like the Jade Kong, the more important it is. So to find this in a grave would show that this is probably a pretty impressive person who had this thing. So what we're gonna see here is a term that you need to know called hierarchy of scale which is kind of like a first grade way of showing that something is really important. The bigger that something is in terms of their form and shape, the more important they are. So for example, the tallest person or the person in the center is probably the most important figure. Now we also see, again, I told you, this is probably telling a story because on one side of this standard, there is a battle scene and you can even see they're showing off their, their very early technology of a chariot and we know it's early chariots too because these wheels aren't spoked um usually they have spokes in them like lines going through them this is like a solid wheel but you can see they're using the wheels to run over their enemies and they've got bows and arrows and it's showing off all this technology but what we're looking at right here is actually a story being told from top to bottom in something called registers so kind of like music registers all right so now we're going into this is you know one line of the story, a second line of the story, and a third line of the story. So they're basically telling the story from top to bottom, kind of like left to right, like you would read it. So this is the other side of the story. So you can see here, this is after the battle is won. You can see them bringing sacrifices here at the bottom. They're bringing um, food to this banquet. Here they are sitting there banqueting and celebrating and listening to music and relaxing. And here is the most important person, the biggest and the whitest person in it to kind of say, okay, this was the most important person. And obviously this was about the ruler who had this victory or somebody who played a big role in this history. Maybe this was a soldier who was important in this battle and he's paying tribute to his king. But look at all this beautiful gold and lapis and red stone in it. All these things that would have been very hard to get just for something to be buried with somebody. That says a lot. So it was found in this tomb alongside other objects. So like one of these is a cylinder scroll, which if you had wrapped this around it, you wouldn't be able to see the message. You'd have to unfold it to actually see it because you would wrap the clay around it and then press it into the mold, kind of like Play-Doh to make this thing, but you wouldn't be able to see it until you unrolled it. So it kind of maybe sacred prayers, secret things. And then this music box you can see here with all this gold and lapis on it, maybe a harp was found next to the body of somebody probably who died playing it. Like they were buried with this person, probably buried alive actually. So this was obviously a very big, important person. Now, 
After the Sumerians, after they established this beautiful civilization with all these ziggurats that really show off their wealth, and we see people being buried with these really wealthy things, naturally somebody's going to want to come in and take over this area. So we get Sargon I, who is from another city-state called Acadia. Now, he, we're not going to really look much at their art in terms of this, but one of the things that they really do is continue doing what the Sumerian do, Sumerians do in terms of how they use their art. So they continue on that tradition. Now, one thing that they did change is the Akkadians wanted to clear the message of that the gods didn't make the things that they do per, like possible because that just gave the gods too much power, but instead... They said that they were blessed by the gods and that the things that they do were liked by the gods, but the gods didn't necessarily do it for them. So, for example, this is actually from the Akkadians. This is the Victory Stela of Naram Sin, which is not on the 250, um, but it really is kind of cool because it's using hierarchy of scale. You can see that Naram Sin here is the biggest person. You can see the activity in registers, like you've got the three sons blessing him at the top, then his action of crossing over the mountain and killing people, you can kind of see how they tell the story this way, but it's not so much that the gods did it, it's more so that the gods blessed and were happy with what they were doing. So moving on from this one, it's not on the 250, so we're going to move on from here. Then we get the Babylonians who come in and take over the Akkadians. And the Babylonians, again, are going to rule twice, they're going to eventually be kicked out and then they're going to come back. But during this time, we see that this area is getting even more expansive, and we get a king called King Hammurabi. And Hammurabi has realized that if he's going to rule over an area this big, he needs to establish some rules that every single person needs to follow. So he is a great believer in the sun god Shamash, and he actually kept that god from the Sumerians to kind of make it easy so people recognize this god and saying. Instead of saying, okay, my God blesses me, he's like, no, your God likes me too. So it kind of gives that a little bit more. Now, Hammurabi, I kind of look at like myself, like I'm a new parent. And when you're trying to figure out parenting over a bigger area like this, you got to kind of figure out how you're going to do your rules and how you're going to maintain order in your area. So what we see him do is kind of establish a law code that's very based on this idea of eye for an eye. Like me as a parent right now, if my daughter hits my son, I'm kind of like, well, Hit him back, you know, let's, you know, let's pick it out. Or if he takes hers, I take his. And it's, you know, it's not the best way of parenting, but I'm figuring it out. And Hammurabi was doing his best too, because he's got to figure out how to rule men and women. So for example, gosh, do I let my son hit my daughter back because she is a girl? Like, do I do that? So he actually puts together this law code, law code called the Code of Hammurabi. And the term set in stone actually comes from this actual work because he had his law code set into a very very important type of stone called basalt which is it's good to carve into but it's very very tough which means that it's not going to erode very easy and the laws are going to stay very very clear and he had this put all over the place so that people could see it and the code that he came up with was extremely eye for an eye based but it also did reveal that there were social inequalities because, for example, if you killed a wealthy person versus killing a slave, the penalty was much worse. Like if you killed a slave, it might be a fine. If you killed somebody else's son, they get to kill your son. Um, women were given different punishments than men were. I mean, it really shows A, patriarchy and B, this idea that, you know, there were different social classes at the time. But he was really doing his best. And at the very top of the stela, which is stila is an important marker for something. Here you can see Shamash giving this law code. You can see Hammurabi holding it in his arms, kind of like Moses with the Ten Commandments. He's like, look, the God gave me these laws to pass down to you. So if you don't like them, don't blame me. I was just asking what the gods thought because then that kind of takes the ownership off of him. So again, religion and rule combined. So this is actually the inscription at the very, very top of it. So you can see that he's really putting this into Shamash. Like he's like saying, hey, your God gave me these to make things better here. So let's accept them and take them. All right. So if a son strikes his father, his hand will be cut off. If a man knocks out the teeth of his equal, his teeth will be knocked out. And so here at the top, by you can see right here in cuneiform, which means wedge shape. So that's the type of writing that they use. 
Here is Hammurabi visually showing that he got these laws from Shamash, a god that the people in this area would recognize, and they would be less likely to fight against it. So the laws he commanded were to be read or heard so that people could see them and understand them, even if they could not be read or if they were not literate people. And he also put it in place that these laws weren't supposed to be changed by later rulers. And a lot of them, because they believed they came from the god Shamash, who these people in this area also believed in. He was like, well, I'm not going to change them because the god obviously gave them to this guy. Here's the Hittites. They came, they saw, this is their lion gate. It's made of stone. The Hittites were one of the only people who had iron and, you know, could build out a rock. They were able, because they had so much iron, to take over the Babylonians, but then trying to rule that area in Mesopotamia from farther away didn't really work out so well. So they weren't around very long. Then we get the Assyrians. The Assyrians are jerks. There's a whole lot of creative ways you can think of to remember the Assyrians and what type of people they were. The Assyrians were originally nomadic. They had incredible military technology that they adapted from other people who attacked them. They were the first place to ever have a standing professional army, but they were horrible people. They were incredibly mean. They were, uh, I mean, the things that they did to the people they took over, they're one of the reasons why the Jewish people had to leave that area at the time and move south and try to get away from this area, which would later push them right into the arms of Egypt. These people were not tolerant of anyone and any kind of opposition whatsoever. They would put it down in the cruelest possible way. And nobody liked them. They ruled through the most horrible force. So under the Assyrians, because nobody liked them and because they were constantly afraid of being attacked, what they had to do was basically set up some of the first major palaces that were also fortresses. And you can see right there in the middle, they've got a ziggurat. So they're continuing on things from this area, but they had to build the citadel of Sargon. And a citadel is a fortress. Like it's a military defense, not just a place to live, but it's a message of we are strong, we are military, we are protecting ourselves, and we are not to be messed with because no one liked them. But right there in the middle is that ziggurat to kind of again show that they do have the blessing of the gods and they talk to the gods, so maybe don't make them angry. So this palace is located today in modern Iraq, and not a whole lot of it remains because, again, you build out with what you have. And in this area, aside from the Hittites, they really just had mud brick. But what we do have left behind are these structures or these forms called Lamassu. Lamassu are bulls and lions and men, which are typically things that you could not tame. And the Assyrians, that's how they consider themselves, is they were bulls you couldn't tame. They were um, lions you couldn't tame. They also had wings because they couldn't be kept down. They put these at the entrances to all the gates of their palaces. And these were guardian figures to protect them because they knew they were constantly under attack. The more you rule by force, the more you have to watch your back. And these Lamassu were constantly watching and showing that they were fearsome and not to be messed with. Now you can see these from two different angles because from the front angle, it looks like they have the standard four legs. But then what they would do is from the side to make it look more natural. If you were looking at it from the side, they would have the four legs. So if you kind of look at it at a weird angle, it looks like they have five legs, but that wasn't meant to be the case to have five. It was meant to be looking natural from the front and then looking natural from the side as much as possible. So these were the beasts of the mountains and seas, which I had fashioned out of white limestone and alabaster, and I had set up in its gates. I made the palace imposing. Like, that's what these were supposed to be, was imposing and scary and always watching over it, wearing the beard of the rulers to show that these are not people you want to mess with. This is the kind of art that the Assyrians put around their palace and put on their buildings to show who they were. They would show themselves killing bulls and lions and the lions and the bulls and whatever were just constantly like in pain and agony. And you can see this poor kitty at the bottom, like he's just dying slowly. And the Assyrians themselves are like, this is nothing. I'm not even sweating. Like, this is so easy. This, their face is calm. Like 
we eat lions for lunch. Like we are bigger than the lions. And which is kind of ironic because their Lamasu had lions in it, which represented them. So whatever. Now, here's something I want you to notice. The Assyrians are changing a little bit from the way that we used to tell stories. So in the Sumerian standard of Ur right here, you can see that they tell the story in the registers, one line, one line, one line. The Assyrians show their stories almost like a movie film, like going through like this, where you would read it in one continuous line from left to right so that you could really see the action that was happening instead of having to read it like from top to bottom. They're kind of advancing a little bit to maybe like third graders, but now they're just the bullies who are picking on everybody else. So this is a, a medium that you do need to know, all right? This is called a bas relief, all right? A bas relief is where you sculpt. So like I, I describe this as like a blind relief because, and almost like braille, because if you were feeling against a wall, you could feel the outline of like, okay, that seems like a lion's face. That's a sphere. That's a man's face. It's carved out to where it becomes three-dimensional and textured. So like almost making it rise out of the rock, right? So that bas relief technique is something we're going to see people adopt. Like different groups are going to adopt this, especially the Persians who are really going to see that this is a way to tell a story. And what we start to see really happen is narrative art. Again, that telling of a story where somebody shows up multiple times and it tells a, like you're narrating a particular story or scene. And what we start to see over time in Mesopotamia is what is happening makes you important, not the size. So you can notice here the Assyrians aren't a whole lot bigger than the lion because that would make them killing the lion look small. But if they're the same size as the lion or smaller, then it makes them look even more powerful that they could beat such a powerful beast. So we're starting to get away from that hierarchy of scale a little bit. So after the Assyrians, they get run out by a group that not a whole lot of people really like either, but at least the Assyrians were gone. And that's gonna be the Neo-Babylonians. So it's kind of like the Babylonians come back and try this again. And they're very famous, especially in the Christian Bible and in old Jewish stories where you hear about um, King Nebuchadnezzar, who was not a very nice guy to the Jews in this area, who had basically moved out to try to get away from the Assyrians. And then they got run over after they built their temple by the Babylonians. And Nebuchadnezzar is known for the story of creating the Hanging Gardens. He's the one that was building the Tower of Babel, which actually, in all truth, was probably a giant ziggurat. So was the Hanging Gardens. Um, so all of those stories probably do have some truth in the fact that Nebuchadnezzar was around and he was absolutely horrible to the Jewish people living in that area. Um, he was known, Nebuchadnezzar, for building really, really big structures to show off his wealth. Um, so, for example, this is the Ishtar Gate, which was one of the entrances to his city. And you can see it's showing off that wealth, kind of like the standard of Ur, because it had that blue lapis in it. Well, this is covered in blue lapis, and it has Lamassu and animals basically being used for decoration on the side. This is just a picture of what they think the story of the Tower of Babel was probably about because it did project up into the sky from the description. So it probably actually was Nebuchadnezzar continuing on by building a giant ziggurat, the biggest in the world that would have been built. And you can see at the top, it's kind of like the White Temple at the top, that this is what they think Nebuchadnezzar was trying to have built at the time. Now we're gonna stop here because the next group that's gonna come in is the Persians. And because we live in the Western world, typically what we hear about the Persians comes from Greek and Roman stories. And the Greeks weren't very big fans of the Persians, especially if you've seen um, the movie 300, where they really, really do hate the Persians. But to be honest, the Persians created one of the most perfect empires at the time. And when they came in and took over Mesopotamia in their massive empire, they were welcomed as heroes, especially they're even mentioned in the Bible as heroes because they drove out the Babylonians. They even invaded all the way into Egypt at one point later on. So I'm going to stop there because you're going to have an assignment to look at before you watch this lecture over Persia. Please complete the assignment over the Persian palace of Persepolis, which will be a lead in and we're going to cover that palace in the next part of this lecture.